All right. All right. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk today about chapters 12 and 13 and including that introductory section before chapter 12. Um, the introductory section and chapter 12 are both very short and then 13 is a little bit more substantive. All right. All right. So all of this is on the theme of object-oriented programming. So I'm gonna introduce like a definition of object-oriented programming, which is a tautology I accept, right? So object-oriented programming is a programming paradigm centered around objects, right? And, you know, so what's an object? I have, um, you know, I don't know if anybody has any input on this, but, you know, I was trying to get a good definition that, you know, so an object is, Objects are collections of data and methods. So, and some characteristics are that every object has a type, which by convention we call a class, at least in every programming language that I've encountered. Um, and the class of an object determines its attributes and how you, how you can interact with the object. Right? right? So, and again, so, yeah, so the key idea is that the nature of the object tells you how you can interact with it i.e. what functions you can use. Right. So the main reason that object-oriented programming is useful is because of polymorphism. Right? So polymorphism is the, tr is the thing that allows you to think about the function's interface separately from, well, I should have finished that sentence, from its implementation. All right. So we're getting into the section of the book where we're dealing with object-oriented programming in R. Um, so what's the deal with that? Um, well, it's complicated. Um, and primarily I think because well, there's multiple ways to do object oriented programming in R, right? So the different object oriented programming systems in R include S3, R6, and S4. Um, and each of these has a chapter in the text. Right, so what do I mean, or what does the book mean by, by an OOP system? And this is a, you know, what I came up with in my own words. So it's a collection of language features that allows one to program in an object-oriented fashion. Sorry, let me see. All right, so that is like the intro section. Um, so chapter 12, right? So chapter 12 is pretty short. So, you know, I kind of wonder, like, what's the point? Um, but I think, you know, it's included to be complete. Um, and it's necessary to clarify a lot of things. Well, let me see what's going on in something in the chat here. Okay. All right. Yeah. So it's, it, it's, it's necessary to, like, clarify some things before we get into the actual substance, right? So in R, the term object gets used in two different ways. One is that everything is an object. And then two, there's the object-oriented systems, which we're going to talk about in more depth. Right? And then here's me just taking a screenshot of the diagram, which I don't quite believe is the best way to represent those things. But you know, who am I to complain? All right, so the question is, do base types constitu constitute an, an OOP system? And no. Right? And the reason for that is, well, two reasons. So functions that act differently on different types are handled in switch statements in C. And new types are impossible for application developers to create, and they're really created by R core. So that's a, a, a key feature that you would desire from an object-oriented programming system, that you can create your own classes. And ASR does not for you that. Well, base types, then, all right? So, um, yeah, sorry. And then what's the difference between base and, and OOP types? So the main difference is that object-oriented objects have a, have, a, have a class attribute, right? Um, yeah. And then in the book, he goes over, well, he says that there are 25 types, but if you list them out, there's only 23 in the book, right? So these are the 23. There are some vector types, 
which is null, logical, integer, double, complex, character, list, raw. And then there's some function types, uh, closure, special, built-in. There's an environment type. There's an S4 type, which corresponds to S4, which we'll get to in two chapters. And then there's types for uh, language components and some more, es some more esoteric stuff. Um, I don't know if it makes sense for me just to read off all the names. And it's in the book. But these are the 23 base types that are discussed in, that are listed in the book, even though it says 25. So if you go to the R internals guide on CRAN, you will see that there are two previously used types, um, one of which was used for internal factors and another one which was used for ordered factors. And these have been withdrawn. So I think that's how you get to 25. Right? And then when you look at the internals, there's an extra type that R is using to represent strings, like not vectors of strings, but a single string, called char XP. Right? And then the other thing he covers is the numeric base type, because that can get used in a couple different ways. Right? So it's sometimes used to mean the double type. And in S3 and S4, it can be used to mean either integer or double. And then the third point to note about numeric is that is numeric is that numeric is used to identify objects that behave like numbers, as opposed to whether or not their type is an integer. So is, is that numeric doesn't, uh, I wouldn't identify a factor, even though like it's underlying type is an integer. All right, so now we get to S3, right? So chapter 13. All right, so S3 is R's oldest object-oriented system. Um, you know, it's very minimalist, it's flexible. It's the most commonly used system in CRAN packages. It's the only system used in base and SATS packages. And it's a lot different to the, to the object-oriented systems you, you probably use in any other widely used language. All right. So the very, very basics. What do you need for an S3 object? Right. So an S3 object is just a base type with a class attribute. Right? Uh, yeah. And nothing else. And there are no checks for correctness in S3. And then okay, I'll just use some code from the book. I'm looking at the factor class. So I create a factor here. Well, the, the, the Hadley creates a factor. So he creates factor, he looks at type of, and type of is integer. But when you do the attributes of F, you see that there's a class attribute called factor. And that's what makes it an S3 object. All right? And you can get the base type of an S3 object by using the unclass function. So you can do unclass F, and it'll just give you, it will strip the class attribute away from it. All right. Yeah. Okay, all right. So can I create my own class? Okay, so let me go back here. Maybe there's the best way to do it. So I'll just write some code. So I'll try to create my own class. And actually, let me... So I'll use this bear reviews data set that Tan had introduced, All right? So I'll download some reviews and I'll just make a simple class that has all the ratings for a single bear, right? So the way I'll do that is I'll create bear function. And I guess what I want is some ratings a name and a style, right? Because I think that's in there. So each row in this reviews table has, you know, it corresponds to a beer, each review. There's a review overall, which is what I'm gonna take. And there's a beer ID and a beer name, right? 
and there's a style I believe. Yeah, base style, right? So what I'm gonna do is I can just do structure ratings. I say name equal. Uh, let me name this brand name. So, um, say quantity yeah. oh did that work i think this is what's necessary all right so now let me actually let me get some let me get some bears out of that so let me get most common equal what does this look like right, so here's what am I with? I'm gonna group by I think this is a unique here, bear underscore bear ID. Right. Summarize. Right. So let's see. All right, so the most common bear is 2093, right? So let me get, yeah. All right, so yeah, I'm just trying to get all the ratings for one bear. So let me filter. So, all right, is that the correct? Two, all right, so 3290, okay. All right, I wanna get ratings equal, sorry, something in the chat here. All right. All right, so let me get ratings. Uh, 2093 to be uh, DF 2093 dot review overall and name 2093 to be DF 2093 dot their name one so all right so what's my name name is 90 minute ipa style is american double imperial ipa and i have a vector of the actual readings i believe right yeah so now I can create bear 2093 if my function is correct. And then name 2093, style 2093. Let's hope that works. Hmm. All right. Well, I have something. So Look at attributes. Yeah, two zero entry. Right. So here I have an object. Let me let me see. Right. So I have some attributes. I have a class as beer, a style attribute, and a name attribute. What happens if I print it? So I believe. Okay. Well. Yeah. And then these are the ratings, right? That's not the most elegant printing, but that's what it is. So that's all you do to create an object, right? 
You create Can I have something that, that's like not at all where you're going, Darren? Was it, sorry? Can I have a question? It's like sure. Just a different rabbit hole. Could we have made our beer function put, rather than having a beer class, it could be the style, like an IPA class, and then you could like use those as your, is that how you would use like those classes as your methods? So like beer.ipa will do a different thing than beer.stout. Is that how you would do that? I'm just trying to think, even though this is a silly example, I'm trying to like <laughs> no. use um, this. Well, no, well, I think, no, I think like stout would be a subclass of beer. IPA would be another subclass. Got it. So like when you, okay. take, the, when, when you take the class attribute of a stout, it would be stout, it, 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 it would be a vector. It would be stout and beer. Okay, that makes sense. That. And then like you could print, I don't know, make some function that like does something different based on the type of beer. I don't, yeah. I'm just spitballing here. Sorry. You can, you can continue. <laughs> All right. No, no. I think some of, your, uh, some of your concerns may be addressed. I will. All right. So, um, all right. So I created that class. I don't know. You know kind of contrived, but you have to look at that. All right, so in the book, I, I had a lot of trouble with this chapter. Like, I didn't think it was the best organization, to be honest. So what he did was he, he created some examples. And the entire time I was reading, I was asking, like, but yeah, but what if my class didn't, wasn't of that particular structure? And then at the end of all those examples, he presented, well, here's a bunch of different styles other than necessarily what we would do. So I don't know if this is the best thing, but I'm going to show, I'm just going to list some different object styles up front, right? So there are four different object styles that he refers to. One is a vector style object, which is based on an underlying vector, which is what I just did essentially, right? My object is based on one vector of reviews and, and the key, um, in, and, and vector style objects have a key property that the length of X is the number of, wait, what is it? Is, is, I should have finished that sentence more accurately, right? But, but, but they have the key property that length of, of length X. Um, and then there's record style objects, which are based on vectors of equal length. There's data frames which are also based on vectors of equal length, but conceptually they are two-dimensional. And I think this is probably the, 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 the class that we're most familiar with. And the number of observations is the number of rows, not the length, right? So yeah, so, and what I, what I didn't say very well or, or at all about vector style objects is that the number of observations is the length of X. And then there's scalar objects which use a list to represent a single thing, right? And the chapter places emphasis on illustrating concepts with vector style objects, All right? So uh, I'll just... Before we go on, sorry, why does, in the book, I could just be like, like stupid, um, at the length of X, um, about like using the vectors package and length could be problematic, what, do you know what they meant by that? Or did I interpret that incorrectly? I do not know what was meant by that. I don't know if anybody else. Yeah, everything that, that, that alluded to the vectors package, I just told myself, um, maybe I'll find out about it later. And- uh, <laughs> Exactly, okay, glad we're on the same page about- Yeah. All right, yeah, so, all right, so I'll just give a couple examples of the other types. Right, so there's a record style object, which is like Pulse XLT, which is, is an object co consisting of 11 vectors, second, minute, hour, M day, month, year, weekday, year day, ISDST, zone, GMT off, right? So here I create a Pulse XLT uh, object, 
And then just to see what it is, I do the on class. So there's 11 vectors in there. So I do on class X and look at one to six, just for the purpose of fitting it on the slide, because if I did more than six, it would go off the slide. So then, so what I did was, so I created three dates, right? So they all be the same year, month, day, but I guess the seconds are changing, right? Year, month, day, hour, minute, and the seconds are changing, this is second minute. So each of these is a vector. And then the seven through 11 elements, uh, this is the weekday, year day is DST. This zone, um, I'm in the Atlantic standard time zone. So that's what you get here. And this is, I guess, my GMT offset. All right, so there's an example. And then you do the attributes of X, the names, uh, all those columns, the classes. So here, so this is both POSIX LT and POSIX T. And then there's a time zone attribute, which is my time zone again. Well, only in one, yeah. All right, and then an example of a scalar object is what you get when you run the LM function. So I just use his example again. Um, you know, LM, I have a model MPG in terms of weight, the data is empty cars. And then I just took a screenshot of looking at it in the, you know, in the RStudio pane. And so basically it's, it's, it's a list of these elements, right? So yeah, so this object is, is just a list. All right, okay, but, so I had previously created a very simple function just using that, right? But he suggests a very particular structure, a tree level structure for defining S3 classes. And in particular, he suggests a constructor, which should be named new underscore my class, of, which is to efficiently create a new object with the correct structure, a validator with the name validate underscore my class, which would do more computationally expensive checks. And then there's a helper function, which would have the name, right? So for instance, the and this, this, this will be what you expose to the user, the person wants to create it. So this should be the most convenient function to use. And then, you know, the validator does all this stuff in the middle and then my class actually creates an object if everything else is specified correctly. Okay. So I'll just look at it. I'll just show the code for the, you know, for an example that he used. All right, so the constructor suggests have one argument for the object type and one argument for each attribute, right? And the types of each should be checked in the constructor. So the constructor just checks the types, All right? So he creates a factor, new factor. He's doing these tests here to make sure that the, uh, that the actual data is integer in fact and that the levels are in fact a character. And then he uses the same structure um, function that I use in my bare example to create it, right? So this is just the constructor. And there's a validator class, which is doing a little bit more computationally expensive checks, right? Right, so this one is doing a check to see if there are any missing values or if they're non-zero, right? Because a factor has to, well, factor by convention is, is using, you know, the natural numbers, right? And then he does another check to make sure that the number of levels corresponds to the number of possible values. That the number of levels is at least the number of, um, no, the number of possible values is at least a number of levels. Um, if I said that the wrong way, someone should stop me. All right. And then there's the helper function, which is, so he just names this factor. So this is what the actual user will use. 
and this is really convenient you know there's not too much levels of indirection and then the the helper calls the validate which will in turn call the constructor right so that's can we it. go over that like a sentence the validator does your like x make sure it's the right type or whatever the yeah. new underscore does the actual class stuff yeah and then the helper makes sure we're going to pass that va that validator turns our data into the right type error so out. the helper is what it is what the user will be using right um Sorry. Um, so, like, like, so, anybody using your package would be just calling factor. Right. That makes sense. Um, right. So they don't see. So factor is the closest to the user level, and then validator. Right. So it's the function that's um, expressed in terms of the things that the user. Is going to think about. The validator does like all the work, and then the constructor is the lowest level thing that's actually adding the class attribute. Um, and I totally believe that that's not a convincing explanation. All right, but maybe we'll come back to it if necessary. All right, so, all right, so, all right, so this next key thing is like, how do you actually interact with S3 objects? Um, so to interact with an object, you have to use functions. And there are two types of functions involved. One is a generic function, which has a well-defined interface. Uh, generic functions, they serve as intermediaries. And then they choose, the generic function, choose which specific method is called based on the class of the inputs, right? And then the second type of function is the method, which is the thing that the generic function picks. And the, the method has to be written to be used with a specific class, right? So I'm gonna look at the example of a generic function. I'm gonna use print, right? And we can use this S3 methods generic function to see all the methods associated with a generic function. So, so I, I, I use S3 methods generic with print and it created, so on my machine with all the different you know, packages that I have installed, there are 209 different functions associated with print. So this is like print.acf, this is print.aes, this is print.anova, print.aov, et cetera, right? So all of these different classes have print functions defined for them. But you, don't, but you can just call print, and then there's a process where the generic finds the particular method, right? So there's 209 eligible functions well, you know, that you can invoke using print. And depending on what packages you have, you might have plus or minus some, right? All right, so, um, hmm. All right, so maybe I should go to here. Yeah, I'll come back to this dispatch. All right, so if you wanna write your own method, there are two cases, right? One, is that there's a pre-existing generic function, in which case you just create your own method of the form generic.class, right? And then the other one is that there is not a pre-existing generic function, in which case you have to do something extra, which is create a new generic before you create your method. All right, so I will now attempt to create my own method for my VR class. 
right? So what I was thinking of doing is creating my own plot. And I'll just plot a histogram of all the ratings for a bit, right? What so, was the thing that Hadley said it was rude to do? Oh, because oh, that's what he was saying is that you could you you could overwrite your own generics. I believe he was saying so. You, well, because R allows you to do anything you want, you can overwrite the generic itself if you want. That would be kind of rude. Um, yeah, if I. I think that's what he said. Let me see. Yes, if you're if you're don't write the generic unless you own the generic or you own the class. Yeah. I still like what a generic is, but sorry. All right, so All right, I'll try to find that later, but it's, but it's somewhere in there. But he talks about the fact that you can. All right, so let me go back to. Doesn't he then go on to make his own method for the the subsetting bracket? Yeah. Generic. <laughs> I mean, he, is, is that right or am I missing that? It seemed like <laughs> that's exactly what he said was rude. Is yeah. that right or am I wrong? No, he, he does do that. Okay. That was my understanding as well. Okay. But it's rude. All right. So take away from. Sorry, was am I? <laughs> All right. Anyhow. Well, to to be fair, in that case, he's defining it for the class that he has created, the secret <laughs> secret class, okay. which is okay. So it's the the class that's sacred, not the met, not the generic itself. So yeah, he's saying it's well, rude. He to, yeah, it's rude to do it if you are if you neither are the class creator nor the generic creator. All right. All right, I'm gonna make a plot function. So I'm gonna plot there, right? Um so I'm just gonna plot a histogram. So my what does my bear look like? So I guess I'll guess I'll use ggplot. Um so alright. So the thing is that I think I need a data frame. So I'll need a bear ds is uh, yeah, I have to unclass it. I think this is what I have to do. Then I can say BDF. So I'll just make a histogram of, yeah, let's see. And I'll need a GD point too. Does that work? Let's see. So if I plot, all right. Okay. So um, I don't like how that looks. So. Um, let's see. All the way from zero to five. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. And so.
Okay. Okay. So I can add, oh, what do I get? How do I get the name? Okay. All right, so I can, I can put in a title here. I can paste. Attributes. Ah, uh, no. My dear, I think it's name. Did I name it name? I think you might have changed it to be your name, or no? Yeah, no, I have a name. Yeah, let's see if this works. This is brings up an interesting thing with the like auto class functions that people write for with their classes. It's like I always think that they shouldn't add any ggplot stuff aside from just plotting. You know, like I you set the theme to be theme black white. I feel like if you're writing a function for a package, like you shouldn't. Be setting the theme, or okay, yeah. I know, I know. This is for an example, but I, I think I, I've seen this a lot in just like packages I've used. That's like they like set the theme to some custom theme, and I'm like, just leave the generic. And let me, you know, the user decide. Yeah, well, I can't deal with that ggplot thing. Likes the default ggplot theme, so I think you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, so. Let me see, no, can I get another beer? Um, what was the second most reviewed beer? All right, so it was 412, right? How do I, do it? does it make sense for me to, all right. Let me see if I can, Reviews from another day. And, you know, I know I'm not supposed to be copy pasting. Overall. Mm. All right, what do I need? Your style. All right, so that you don't be the same. All right, so now I can get here for twelve and here. Ratings for 12, name for 12, style for 12. All right, now I can plot here for 12. Does that not work? All right. So I've done two examples. So I hope that convinces you that I actually wrote a method. Sorry, I kind of fell behind in the chat. Right. Just, I think it's kind of nonsense. Or, well, it's relevant, but... Uh, wow, rude. Off topic as well. What is that? Sorry. Is that a common thing to create a plotting method for your situations? Um, you're asking if, if it's common to make a plot method? Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen that. Like, Tony was being a hater on some package. I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's like... So, so yeah, I was, uh, I was using the Daleks package for, like, interpretable machine learning, and it's, like, it always, like, uses uh, its plotting functions that have, like, this purple background. I'm like, it just... It just drives me a little insane because I just got a, I don't want the purple background. Uh, I think uh, some of the old forecast package uh, for like time series had like kind of overriding some of the defaults. I think the, mod, the newer ones don't anymore, but 
Uh, I don't know, those are two examples that came to mind. I see what you're saying. I guess I'm just getting a little lost with like a plotting function, but the plot function is going to do different things based on what? Based, like, how are the classes determining how the plot is different? No, so when you write a class, you write a plot to accompany it. Right, so plot, like the plot generic. Um, you like know, a plot beer, right? You, yeah. uh, you, you created all the extras, like you did the histogram, but then you also had the title and like the theme. Um, so it's like that extra stuff. Okay, okay, it's clicking now, thanks. All right, so. Right, so I mean, because I, I'm the owner of the bear class, I just decided, I took it upon myself that a royal blue histogram is the definitive way to see a bear, like the reviews. Got it, that makes sense. Right, so, you know, or you can write your own summary or anything like that. Um, all right, so, all right, so that was what I was gonna do here. So let me go back here, all right. Um, Okay, so what method, so no, so what happened there is I never type plot.bear to plot, right? I just type plot and the generic function plot found my plot.bear, right? So how do you determine which method was actually used? Um, so we use the S3 dispatch function and then he gives some examples here. So in here, he creates a matrix, and then he takes the mean of X, and S3 Dispatch shows you all the options, right? And mean the default is the actual one that got called. Or actually, the to print ordered X um, is probably a little bit more useful because let me see. Let me go back to, where am I? All right, so. All right, so. So if you draw a class ordered X, right? So the class of ordered X is ordered and factor. Right, so it looks at all these options. There's, there's print.ordered, print.factor. So print.ordered doesn't exist, but print.factor exists. And then there's print.default. The asterisk says that print.default is defined as well. But anyhow, so when you call print.print print on an ordered, on, on, on this object here, um, it finds print.factor. Print.ordered isn't defined but it's an option. Well, it's one of the options that the method dispatch looks through. What does it mean to be defined? Um, to be defined like um, someone actually wrote the function. But it's not relevant for that object. It's not, well, so for instance, okay, so like I could create a subclass of bear called IPA. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I don't necessarily have to write plot.ipa, right? If my class is IPA and beer and I plot, I don't have to write, I don't have to write a plot.ipa function if I'm happy with what plot.beer is doing. Because what IPA is inherited from beer. Yeah. I see. What if IPA is a special subclass of beer? What is the inheritance hierarchy? How would you have to specify an IPA no, method? Okay. Well, no, okay, so, okay, so the, our later slide points out that the hierarchy is completely in your head. Like, um, you have to have the discipline to make sure that the hierarchy is upheld. But, so it's up to you as a programmer to decide, do I need to implement, are IPAs so much different from all the other bears that I need a different plot that IPA for Right, but that's your choice. And you actually have to implement that inheritance by 
specifying the class object correctly in that it, the class object should be a vector if you put one the first entry is IPA and the second entry is bear. So, um, so in the, so you would do, uh, it would be something like IPA function. It would have the same, it, it would have the same parameters of that of, as a bear. Um, you know, so everything there would be same except that when you get to the class, your class would be IPA and bear, right? So just pretend that everything else is filled in in this function. So that's, that's how you define an IPA, which is a subclass of bear, meaning, so, well, actually there's another slide which I think might clarify this more concretely. But so when you call a generic, the generic can look for, you know, like if, if you call plot, plot is going to look for plot.ipa or plot.bear in that order. And the choice to implement which one of these is completely up to you. Yes, I think IPA extends bear. But it's not, but again, but it's not really, there's nothing official um, checking that constraint. That's something that you have to have the discipline to maintain. So like if you were to make some part of the IPA class that this plot has a pink color, it would inherit all the rest of the beer plot attributes except for that would be over? No, no, you would, no, no. Or no, you'd no. have to overwrite, you'd have to write its own yeah. method. You have to write its own uh, plot.ipa. I guess you can have, yeah. I mean, you can have it call plot.bear and add an extra ggplot, you know, op, you know, proto, whatever they call those things, components. But yeah, but you have to write plot.ipa if you want to implement it separately. I think it's good to say like S3 is not object oriented like anything else is object oriented. Like this yeah, idea yeah, of an yeah. inheritance is not is not the you know the way you think about inheritance in Java or Python or anything like that. It's 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 really just defining how you're going how functions get applied to the object and in what order is it going to find a function to apply to the object. Right. Yeah. And I think R6 is more like the encapsulated model of object oriented that you would use in any other language. Yeah. So, but let's see how we do this. Where's my, all right. Sorry. Okay. All right. So if you want to create your, all right. So we kind of run in short on time. Um, so if you want to create your own generic, this is how you do it, use in, use method. Um, I was thinking to possibly write my own generic, but I won't. All right. So how does, and this kind of backwards, so how does use method work? Um, it basically creates a vector of method names with generic uh, dot and then class X and default. All right. So um, this can't this be bigger? This is fine. Oh. Yeah, I think there's something missing here. Okay, but. So what happens here is that use method delegates to some internal, I believe, if I remember correctly. That's not a good explanation. All 
Uh, I don't hear anybody complaining. So. All right, so how do we deal with inheritance, which we've been talking about, right? So in, in, we implement inheritance by having a class attribute, which is a vector. Um, so if, if a method is not found in the first item of the class vector, R will look fit in the second and so on. And a method can, can delegate work by calling next method. And S3 dispatch reports delegation with the single um, line arrow. Right, so that would be down here. So what happened was it found this function here and then it was delegated to the sum, the internal function. Um, right, and then here's an example. Um, we create a vector of the class ordered. So I create a vector uh, ordered. It's, it's an ordered vector with two elements, X and Y, and then I do the class of it. So the the you know the, the class of it is ordered and factor in a vector and then if i subset the vector so if i take the first one um it's going to look right so it's going to look for uh bracket dot ordered which isn't there it's going to look it's going to look for bracket dot ordered it's not there then it's going to look at bracket dot factor which is there and that delegates to bracket internal, to the internal. Right. Uh, Darren, why mm -hmm. is order not there? It seems like ordered is there, right? No, no, no. Order, oh, so ordered isn't, ordered is in the list that it looks true. So in the functions that actually exist, there's an asterisk next to them. Oh, I see, okay. Okay. So if we go back to like here, like there's a print of default existing, for instance, yeah. So yeah, so that's, that's me not explaining the output of S3 dispatch. So all of these, this, these lists are the candidates and it goes through one by one. So order isn't there, order that factor is there, um, apparently, uh, the default doesn't exist, and then it, it goes down to internal. So, well, factor delegates to internal. All right, so, um, and then, yeah, so, and then as we were alluding to, S3 imposes no constraints on the relationship between sub and super classes. So the recommended practice is that the base type of the subclass should be the same as the superclass, and the attributes of the subclass should be a superset of the attributes of the superclass, right? So if IPA is a beer, you should have everything that you know about that beer, you should know it about the IPA, and then you possibly have extra information. All right. All right, so dispatch details. This is where the chapter got kind of weird for me, um, but, here we go, All right? So there, there are a few situations where it gets complex. And in the book, he says, well, you could stop here if this is your first time in S3, but we're going forward, All right? And, and the three cases he uses are internal generics, group generics, and double dispatch. All right, so, all right, so S3, does, and then, oh, so maybe I should have this one as well. So how does S3 dispatch with base objects? So, Let's look at, at, at two different cases. One is x1, which is a vector of one to five, right? Which is one, two, three, four, five. If you do the class of x1, you get integer. And then if you call mean of x1, look at what happens. This, this doesn't show. Okay. All right, so you all can't see the bottom of the screen. All right. Um, I'll just copy paste it, right? So when, when you call mean of x1, it looks for mean.integer, mean.numeric, and then mean.default. On the other hand, I create another object, x2, which, you know, by this line of code here, it's structure x1, class equal integer. So the class is still, the class here is the same as the class before, but when I call mean, and let me just, Bring this over, yeah, because
Does that not work? You haven't defined x1 yet. Oh, yeah. What was x1 again? One to five. All right, and okay, so All right, so the point is that is that even though they're both class integer, the sequence for x1 has mean that numeric in it. So it's not just the class attribute that all, so all of that is to say that the class attribute on its own doesn't uniquely determine the method, even though they end up calling the same method, right? So uh, this patch is actually done on what's called the implicit object. And the implicit object is based on well, um, it's the string array or matrix if the object has dimensions. And then the second step is if it doesn't, is the result of type of with a few minor tweaks, which are not explained in the book and will not be explained to you by me. And string, and then the last one is the string numeric if the object is integer or double, right? And you can use the S3 underscore class function to get the implicit object type. So the, what is an implicit object? It's the, the it, okay, so that's, yes. that, it's, it's circular. Like, I think, I think he defined it to be the answer to the question that he asked. So uh. the, the implicit object, um yeah the, the implicit object type is so the implicit object type is the type that the the generic is actually going to call well is going to use sorry that's a terrible explanation but um so is that is, so it's the so plot dot beer plot dot IPA plot dot stout plot dot whatever you want, then you're gonna actually in this one instance invoke plot on an IPA. No, so no, 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 no. So one specific yeah. instant, the implicit class object. No, no. All is, right. So here's what we're talking about. We are talking about base objects now. Oh. This this situation is what happens if you call an an S three generic function where the input is a base object. If it was an S three object, it would it, we wouldn't have this slide. Okay, I think I so, get it. Maybe right. So the implicit object type is 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 something I that I don't think well it exists, but you know, but it's what you use in lieu of that class attribute. Oh, okay. All right, so yeah, this is for the special case where you call in an S3, you know, generic with a, with a base object. All right, and then one of the other cases is that there are internal generics um in a, and how they differ then you know some base functions is that they don't use use method is that they call some c functions um dispatch group or dispatcher eval and um so here's an example get in you know the first element of sister time you know well actually so i actually used this example before so you would have seen an example of calling the internal 
method. All right, that's the internal. And then here's where like, I completely didn't understand what was going on. Well, I mean, but so group generics, right? So there are four group generics. One is the math group containing, the, you know, the mathematical functions, the ops group, which is operators, summary group, and this bunch of functions, and the complex group, right? And so my understanding is you write math.class or ops.class, summary.class, et cetera, and it will become a candidate if any of the group members gets called in your class. And what do you mean by candidate? Um, well, okay, so remember when we were going through, like, so, all right, so that's the term I'm using for all of these functions here. Okay. So, like, it's something that could potentially be called by a generic. Well, no. Well, actually, yeah, it's, right? So if any of the group members gets called. So for instance, well, so, all right, so in particular, he, he shows the, the source code for math.diff time, right? So for the diff time class, Right, there's a group generic defined math.diff time. So this would be called, this could potentially be called if you try to take, you know, uh, the square roots of a diff time or the cosine of a diff time. Right, so the the group generic is a stand-in for, so math.diff time becomes a, you know, a, um, a potential stand-in for abs.diff time, sine.diff time, square root.diff time, et cetera. Um, yeah, I wanted it to be like what, Scott just put in the chat that groups just save you from listing all the functions that you want to be able to call on your class. But yeah, it feels like that's not what the chapter was saying, but I wish I knew what the hell was going on. I yeah, kind of get what you're saying, Darren. Well, I don't get what I'm saying. So if you get it. <laughs> I, I think like it's really hard unless you kind of try to trace through like the actual R source code to see what it's doing to figure out how this all kind of fits together. Like this is some, there's a reason he says skip this if it's true. <laughs> Sorry, like this is, this is low level. Uh, and I, you know, I think it's, it feels like vestigial code that is just ingrained in how R works. And, yeah, I, I'm reading this book. I'm like, a, I'm a huge completionist. I want to understand every sentence and be like, we've read the book and know everything. But I've come to a point here that I'm like, when the hell is this going to come up in any programming day to day at any job? And if everyone agrees that it's not, then let's continue I on. <laughs> I, I think to answer, I would just search GitHub for example examples yeah, of people yeah, implementing yeah. a math dot whatever ops dot yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. It exists. There are people who have done it, like, and there's Stack Overflow questions about it. But okay. who knows? All right. Okay. All right, and then I think uh, yeah. So yeah. Like I said, I've found it to be very cryptic, but I think these are like two key facts, right? So defining an, a single group generic for your class overrides the default behavior for all of the members of the group. And then most group generics involve a call to next method. So like math at diff time, he gives an example. Right. And then the last thing is double dispatch. So the operators in the ops group, they're, they're like, many of them are binary operators, right? So the dispatch has to depend, has to make sense for both operators, right? So if you add in A plus B, you know, the plus function that's being called 
has to make sense for A and for B. And so for the example, you know, he gives, you know, he creates a date and then there's an integer one. Um, so you can add one day to the date or you can add in the other direction. You can add, so you can add date plus integer or you can add integer plus date, right? And, you know, addition is, is commutative. So both of these should give you the same result, right? However, plus might be defined differently for, in, for integer and for date, right? So you have to do like a, a method dispatch to figure out which one to call. Well, you have, and, and that procedure is called double dispatch, right? And the details for double dispatch is that you look up the methods for each operator and there are three cases, right? So if the methods are the same, you use that method. If the methods are different, use the internal method with a warning. And if one method is internal, use the other method, right? And then, yeah, um, here's my sudden ending. Yeah. I think we're- That was really brave of you to present on this chapter. So thank you for that. Yeah. And I kind of get what double dispatch is. That one's, that one's a little bit clearer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this easily could have been two weeks of material. <laughs> yeah. A lot was, of stuff. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I did have one question for Tyler about that, what you threw in the chat with the like recursive scenario. But we could just talk on Slack uh, about that since it's already okay. late. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I, have no, I have no idea what's happening there. That's like as close to generics because he's overwriting math. I don't know if anyone wants to look at that and drive themselves crazy, but um, this was really awesome. Thank you, Darren. All right. I was definitely one of the people that stopped when he recommended to stop. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> was, everything was kind of new after that when, when you were talking. I have like 9,000 questions on the chapter, but I'll just throw them all on the Slack or wherever. Um, and we'll just suss it out there. But I learned a lot and I still don't really, like I understand the constructor validator helper thing, but is that more like you being a programmer that's helping people to make S3 classes? Yeah, I think so. Because uh, it, it's not as, at least S, S3 is so flexible that there, and there's no restrictions. Uh, so it's like, it's really, yeah, meant to help, I know, have a structure whenever you're creating a class. Yeah, I, I think it's just best practice that from his experience writing many classes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good, um, good software development hygiene. But, yeah. Anyone That's else good. have any closing comments, right. concerns? Well, awesome. Thank you so much. That no was really great. No. Thank you. Um, I had a comment about the uh, S3 thing and realized my mic wasn't working. Um, <laughs> but uh, basically, I think it's like what it's like if you're developing an S3 class, um, you intend for others to like contribute to the programming of um, or do things based on that S3 class. Um, so having a validator separate from a constructor. Uh, makes sense if there are other ways to create that thing without using your current function. Which okay. there always is. <laughs> Which in R, all you have to do to make it a class, a thing of that class is class X is now pi. Yeah. Beer. Yeah. And so like, it's not like, the, so like when you inherently change 
um, class of beer IPA to beer stout, all you do is assign the word stout to where IPA used to be. And it's now a class stout, uh, which was a big upgrade, um, but nothing actually changed internally without being validated. Right, so then you would call the validator. Is this actually a stout when it says it's a stout? Oh, okay. So the validator helps that kind of fragile, um, easy class switching. It, yeah, like community big, programming, I think. Yeah, it's like it's adding the structure that is just not there in S three. I mean, S three is a very bare bones system that has very few restrictions, and so by having those three options, it kind of says, all right, here's, here's what you should use to make these objects. Here's how you should test if a thing is that object. And here's how to do it if you're an end user and you don't want to specify all the details. And like, there might be a lot of setup work in creating, you know, all the things that need to pass to the constructor. And that's what that third option would be for. Okay, it's still pretty like um, theoretical for me. So I might try to like build on your code, Darren, and make like a beer.ipa and a beer.stout. And from there, maybe we can work together and make a validator and a helper or something. Huh. Well, um, it yeah, it would be an IPA. And then, yeah, sure, sure. We'll figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Um, yeah. Does right. anyone want to take on? R6. No pressure. I, I, let, let, let me check my schedule. I'll, I'll, I'll think about it. Uh, I've had, <laughs> I've, right now my, my son is being tested for COVID, so that could complicate Oh, no. It. Well, thank you. For I, 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 we don't think he had it. We think it's strep, we think it's strep throat, but. Okay. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll, I'll take well, a look at I'll, it. I'll give everyone a day or two because, and I'll just be the fallback person. Um, 